Over the past couple of weeks, I've been to several meetings triggered by our various congregational changes that are coming. So the first meeting I went to, all the pastors who were going to be commissioned and ordained at the end of the May, they met with the bishop. And Bishop Scholl wanted to share his vision of a permission-giving church. That's one in which the laity are given permission. They're actually encouraged, they're empowered to find their own ministries and respond to God's call on their life and lead those ministries themselves. And then on Tuesday, I was with all the pastors of Annapolis region, and we were meeting to learn how congregations are to become more missional. So it's fine that we gather for excellent worship, and it's fine that we have top-notch Bible studies, but we also have to serve our communities. And so the leaders of Annapolis District were encouraging us to become the good news ourselves and uh, work with the lonely and the homeless and the disadvantaged right in our neighborhoods. And then on Thursday I went to another meeting and it was with all the pastors that are going to ch move to a new congregation on July 1st. And while I won't be leaving you, we are going to begin to work with our sister congregation at Severin on July 1st. And our ministry will be expanded to the whole community of Severin. But in this meeting, the focus was on respecting congregations and getting to know congregations before you, guess what, led them through change. All three of these meetings that I went to were focusing in on change. And so I've been with a lot of people who are nervous and a lot of people who are excited this week. Jesus' followers had been experiencing some major changes themselves. Now they'd already given up quite a bit to initially follow Jesus. But now that the one person that they gave up everything for to follow has died. Buried. They, at least they thought he was dead and gone. But the body's missing. And the women have come and said that they've heard an angel tell them that he's risen and that they should go to Galilee. And then Cleopas and his friend come back from Emmaus and they say how they've seen the risen Christ in the breaking of the bread. Right there, while they're gathered and talking about these things, right at that moment, Jesus is suddenly among them. That's kind of creepy, don't you think? You're talking about the boss and suddenly he's right behind you? And doesn't it make you think, oh, what have I just said? Have I said the right thing? Have I said the respectful thing? I don't think at that moment, well, Scripture tells us right at the moment they weren't worried about respectful. They were worried. They were startled. They were terrified. The risen Christ just appeared in the room with them. And the live Christ is right there. And they're not really sure what to do with that. Is it really Jesus? He says, look at my hands. Look at my feet. It's really me. It's truly Jesus. Has his body just been resuscitated? Now when this story is told in the Gospel of John, John says the doors were locked when Jesus suddenly appeared. A fleshy, resuscitated human being can't walk through locked doors. Is Jesus a ghost? He says, have you anything to eat? And they give him boiled fish. Does a ghost eat boiled fish? The risen Christ is mysterious but real. He often eludes human explanation and yet is not a human fabrication, says New Testament professor Charles Corsair. God is greater than my imagination, wiser than my wisdom, more dazzling than the whole universe, and as present as the air I breathe and utterly beyond my control. Those are the words of Barbara Brown Taylor, a theologian. theologian. No one really knows how to scientifically explain the resurrection, so we rely on our personal experience of the Spirit of Christ. 
while he was in that room with the disciples, he opened their minds to the scripture and connected the dots so that everybody in that room fully understood that he was the promised Messiah. But Jesus didn't just come to the disciples to fulfill scripture and create witnesses of his resurrection. He had work for them to do. In each gospel, Jesus has a two-part resurrection message. The first part is, don't be afraid. So in Mark, at the empty tomb, the angel says, do not be alarmed. At Matthew, first an angel, and then Jesus himself say, do not be afraid. In Luke, the comforting phrase is, peace be with you. Jesus sees that they're unsure. Well, really, they're startled and terrified. And he says, peace be with you. And in John, also, Jesus repeats, peace be with you, at least three times. The most common command in scripture is not go and be more loving. The most common command is don't be afraid. Author and pastor John Oatberg writes, the reason God says fear not so much is not because he wants us to be spared emotional discomfort. In fact, he says it to get people to do something that is going to lead into greater fear anyway. I think God says fear not so often because fear is the number one reason that human beings are tempted to avoid doing whatever God is about to ask them to do. So that's where the second part of the message comes in. In each gospel, Jesus asks them for more, like go to Galilee, or feed my sheep, or go and make disciples. Here in Luke, Jesus asks that repentance and forgiveness of sins be proclaimed in his name to all nations. He's asking them to change the direction of their own lives for the purpose of changing the direction of other people's lives. Metanoia is the Greek word used in the Bible for repentance. This term is derived from meta, meaning beyond, and neoio, meaning perception, understanding, or mind. So metanoia, or repentance, is more than just saying sorry. It's a complete change of mind. It's embracing thoughts beyond your perceived limitations. It's a total reorientation to the Christian message found in the life and message and mission of Jesus Christ. Jesus is asking that his followers go all in for the reign of God and get others to do the same. Metanoia comes with a cost. We have to face our own sinfulness. We need to realize that we've missed the mark, that we've been off course, and that can be hard and ugly. In psychology, Carl Jung uses the term metanoia to describe a healing through a psychotic breakdown. He proposes that a mental meltdown could actually be a productive process that leads to rebirth. As Christians, we're seeking a spiritual realignment through the forgiveness of sin. And we know that facing our transgressions, our misdeeds, or our missteps is hard work. But it's also life-affirming. Jesus liberates us from our errors. They are lifted from our shoulders, and we are given a fresh start. Offering people a chance to repent doesn't sound like so much fun, but offering them a chance to turn their lives around is awesome. Change costs us in fear and stress when we face our wrongs and move out of our comfort zone. But not changing also has a cost. Greg Levoy, author of Callings, describes this cost as a common cold of the soul. He writes that retreating from change leads to sinful patterns of behavior that never get confronted and changed. Abilities and gifts that never get cultivated or deployed until weeks become months, 
and months turn into years. And one day you're looking back on your life. Deep, intimate, grunt, gut wrenching, honest conversations that you never have. Great, bold prayers that you never prayed. Exhilarating risks that you never took. Sacrificial gifts that you never offered. Lives that you never touched. And you're sitting in a recliner with a shriveled soul and forgotten dreams. And you realize there's a world of desperate need and a great God calling you to be part of something bigger than yourself. And you see the person you could have become but did not because you never followed your calling. Our faith is not just a simply a collection of ideas and, and concepts. That's Gnostic knowledge. And it's not pure transcendence. That's spiritual thought. Our faith is gritty, it's fleshy, it's tangible, it involves renewal and change and repeated realignments to the very real presence of Jesus. When Jesus shows up and says, peace be with you, he isn't suggesting that you suppress your emotions. He's there offering you the power of his presence moving out beyond our presence limits and going into new territory is frightening. Change invokes fear. Growth and fear go together like mac and cheese. They're a box set. They're going to lead to stronger lay members, a missional focus for our congregation, and expanded ministry in Severin are a bit frightening, but they're also exciting because we're buoyed up by that peace of Christ. We have been called by God to invite others to experience God's grace and love, to rely on God's grace, on Christ's peace as we move through our fears and we grow, and to be moved by the Spirit to go out and use that growth to make a difference in our community. We are called to show others of all nations, people of all types, that lives can be changed, Forgiveness is there, and Christ's peace can be theirs, too. Peace be with you. Amen. Also with you.